it will burn the fat because if insulin is low, it has no other option. And this is when we get into the realm of ketogenesis. So I hate to bring in a new process here, but this is when ketogenesis begins to occur, where the liver has all of this fat coming to it. And because insulin is low, it cannot store it. And it continues to burn fat, continues to burn fat. In fact, it burns so much fat constantly that the entrance of the fat to basically to continue to be burned starts to kind of close up. It gets too full. This process of the citrate cycle, this biochemical process of ultimately kind of the end product of burning fat through the citrate cycle. The citrate cycle gets so full of fat burning that it starts to tell the rest of the liver cell, hey, I can't handle anymore. And thus the only other option opens up, which is ketogenesis. So ketogenesis is the end result then of the liver seeing a lot of free fatty acids, but not having, but but having low insulin and thus not being able to stop burning fat. Now that's the fasted state or the low insulin state, higher free fatty acids coming from the fat cell and the liver is just burning it. Now, when might there be a state based on what I described earlier, anytime insulin would be elevated, which is a necessary signal telling the liver to hold on to that fat and indeed to store it, to convert it into triglycerides to hold on to, that can only happen if insulin is elevated. But if insulin and free fatty acids are always only in the inverse, well, then you'd never have all of that availability of the free fatty acids unless the fat cells have become insulin resistant. Now, you'll recall from earlier discussions, when the fat cell has reached a point of hypertrophy that it can't really grow any further, it will start to become insulin resistant. And remember, insulin's main signal at fat cells is to inhibit lipolysis, to prevent the breakdown of the fat. But that's the very signal that gets broken as the fat cell becomes very insulin resistant. So now you have this uniquely um, harmful state where insulin is elevated, which would normally be inhibiting lipolysis, resulting in lower free fatty acids, but the fat cell isn't listening anymore. Now it's breaking down fat, even though insulin is trying to tell it to not break down fat. Thus, we have high insulin and elevated free fatty acids, and now it's the perfect metabolic storm. So now the liver is seeing all of these free fatty acids leaking from the very insulin resistant fat cells. And the high insulin is now signaling to the liver, hey, you're getting all that fat. Maybe you wanted to burn it, but I'm making you store it because insulin dictates fuel use within cells, every cell of the body, most especially the liver. Even though insulin has a modest impact on the liver of pulling in nutrients, it has a very strong impact on the liver's ability to release those nutrients. And in this case, it is a wicked combination. So the elevated insulin reflective of an insulin resistant state within the body and the elevated free fatty acids reflective of an insulin resistant state of the fat cells themselves together combine to tell the liver to, to basically overfeed the liver and not allow the liver to break down any of that fat, forcing it to convert it into the storage form of triglycerides. But remember, at the same time that insulin is elevated, why would the insulin be elevated? A key part of this is going to be the chronic and frequent spikes of glucose. And so then even still, in a case of elevated insulin with insulin resistance, very likely there is an abundance of glucose in this body. Otherwise, the insulin can't be elevated for very long. So we also still have the de novo lipogenesis being relevant here um, because the chronically elevated insulin is going to be telling the liver, hey, you have a lot of glucose too. And so while I'm forcing you to store all of that fat coming from the insulin resistant fat cells, I also want you to continue to make fat. So de novo lipogenesis, goes up a lot. And remember, in people with fatty liver disease, in the study I showed you earlier, it's three, at least three times higher than that happening in people without uh, fatty liver disease.